Hey y'all, so today we're going to be going into chapter 14 and we're going to be talking about the fifth stage called the harrowing of the soul. And uh, this this one is um, really getting to the, the meat of um, the transitional phase after we have come into the awareness of the darkness that operates in the world and um, while we're trying to get our, our footing um, in that and, and to, you know, uh, get grounded in our understanding. Um, because again, it's one thing to receive information. It's another thing to be able to process that information and turn it into an understanding. So it's like um, describing that transitional phase, which she calls a descent into the underworld, right? It's like we're um, almost like a meditative state where you're uh, marinating, I like to say, <laughs> I like to use that phrase, marinating on the information you've received until it um, it's done processing like a computer, you know? Sometimes our minds are like a computer. And um, and then finally it's it, it, you know, pops up and it gives you the result, it gives you the understanding. So it is a process. And I just, you know, I wanna open this section up by talking about the definition of the word harrowing which is really interesting to me. So again, the stage, the fifth stage, she calls the harrowing of the soul. So harrow, if something is harrowing, it means it's uh, acutely distressing or, or painful, right? Something distressful, something um, that's, that's gonna shake you up in a bad way, right? But also, I learned that harrowing means processing uh, or it, it, I'm sorry, it's a process to remove the dead thatch on the ground, right? To lift vegetation up. So it's like aerating the roots um, so that um, airflow can happen and water can get down to the, the um, good part of the vegetation on the ground and it's getting rid of the dead thatch, okay? So I thought that was kind of cool and um, two seemingly unrelated things, right? But really I feel like this um, supports uh, what happens as you go through <laughs> processing distressful things, right? This transitional phase, because what it's doing is it's preparing you, just like the harrowing process for the ground to remove the, the dead thatch to um, allow the, the new vegetation to spring forth. It's the same way with us, and we're going to get into that, talking about um, the process of new life being brought about within our own psyche. So that's what this section's about. And I hope that you enjoy it. I really enjoyed reading it and I'm excited to present it to you all and to share it with you. So let's move forward. All right, I feel like my camera's crooked, hang on. <laughs> it kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> okay, there we go. So she opens this section talking about um, the part of the story um, in The Handless Maiden where the king goes off to war. So um, this is after um, the king and the maiden fall in love. You know, he, he sees her in the parrot orchard, right? And he, he vows to love her forever and they get married. So um, then he goes off and um, he instructs his mother uh, to watch over uh, the maiden who is now the queen, right? Because he's the king. Um, and to let him know to send him um, a message if she were to give birth to a child. So that's what happens. And during this time, if you remember in the story, um, the messengers going back and forth between the king's mother and the king, um, communicating about um, his wife actually uh, being pregnant um, and, and giving birth, the, the messages get intercepted by the devil himself uh, because the messengers, as they, they stop to rest at the river, again, we have that river symbolism. So this is something for you to think about. She doesn't really go into this a whole lot, but because we've talked about it, you know, the symbolism of the river, I just find that to be such an interesting theme in these stories. So the messengers fall asleep at the river. They're, they're, they don't intend to, they just intend to stop and rest there, but they all fall asleep every time they get near it. And that's where the devil pops out. And um, remember in the story, in the Frozen stories, the mother who is singing about the river, teaching her daughters, Anna and Elsa, about the river. And that, in those movies, she's saying, you know, to be careful, because if you um, 
go in too deep, you may drown. So there's danger there. So here in this story, we have, it's almost like a, they're lured into, or lured, <laughs> I can't say that word, close to the river and um, intending to, sl to rest, but they sleep. And that's when, and you can also consider yourself asleep when you're naive, right? You're not on guard. You're not vigilant to catch uh, a predator, someone who's going to, you know, come in and and snow you over and manipulate you and exploit you, take advantage of you or worse, okay? So um, the psyche can also uh, become asleep. And remember, all these characters in the story are representing different aspects of one person's psyche, okay? So um, that's what happens. These messengers going back and forth between the king and his mother are falling asleep and the devil is changing the message out to become like a worse and worse message every time. So um, in the end, um, the king's mother gets a message thinking it's from him instructing her to kill his wife the queen um and to send proof of of her being killed through um i think eyes and, and a tongue right and so what she does is they they kill a doe they sacrifice a doe and um and send that all right so that's kind of where um especially where it, where it um, ends up but actually um, the king's mother sends the maiden off, the, the queen off for her, for her own safety because she thinks that her son, the king, wants her dead at this point because of the devil changing up the messages. So she sends her off with her newborn uh, somewhere different um, to an inn in the woods to hide and be safe. So that's kind of um, this section of the story. So she says, like Bluebeard, if you remember that story early in the book, Jason of Golden Fleece fame, the Hildago and La Llorona, and other fairy tale and mythological husbands and lovers, the king marries and is then called away. So this is a common theme. Why are these mytho, mytho husbands always trotting off so soon after the wedding night? The reason is different in each tale, but the essential psychic fact is the same. The kingly energy of the psyche, remember the gatekeeper, falls back and recedes so that the next step, next step in the woman's process can occur, as well as the testing of her newly found psychic stance. In the king's case, he has not abandoned her, for his mother watches over her in his absence. So that's a little bit different in this story. The next step is the formation of the maiden's relationship to the old wild mother and to birthing. And remember, the old wild mother is symbolized by the king's mother in this story. The testing is of the love bond between the maiden and the king, and the maiden and the old mother. One has to do with love between opposites. The other has to do with love of the deep female self, capital S. The departure of the king is a universal motif in fairy tales. When we feel not a withdrawal of support, but a lessening of the nearness of that support, we can be sure that a testing period is about to begin when we will be required to nourish ourselves on soul memory alone till the loved one returns. Then our night dreams, particularly the most striking and penetrating ones, are the only love we shall have for a time. So again, this is all a process in the developing psyche, right? Away from being naive towards being wise and discerning. Okay, so then she goes into examples of some of the dreams that she just referenced here. Um, and, and the theme that I'm finding between these examples is that they're all comforting. And so as an example, here's one. She says, yeah, another woman dreamed that she had open heart surgery and that the operating room had no roof so that the overhead operating light was the sun itself. She could feel the light from the sun touch her exposed heart. She heard the surgeon say no further surgery was necessary. She says, dreams like these are experiences of the wild feminine nature. So it's like that nurturing um, nourishing, motherly type nature. Emotionally and often physically profound, they are feeling states that are like a food cache. We can draw from them when spiritual sustenance is spare. As the king trots off on some adventure, his psychic contribution to the descent is held in place by love and memory. 
the maiden understands that the kingly principle of the underworld is committed to her and will not forsake her, as he promised before they married. Often at this time, a woman is full of herself. Herself, she's got with a capital S here, okay? She is pregnant, meaning filled with a nascent idea about what her life can become if she will only pursue her work. I love that, right? Our purpose, our calling. It is a magical and frustrating time, as we shall see, for this is a cycle of descents. So there is another around the bend. Um, yes. So she says, it is because of the burst of new life that a woman's life seems again to stumble too near the edge. This is kind of going along with the theme of the river, right? And jumps right into the abyss again. But this time, the love of the inner masculine and the old wild self will sustain her as never before. And of course, having these as outer forces is good as well, right? But she says, um, yes, it is because of the burst of new life that a woman's life seems again to stumble too near the edge and jumps right into the abyss again. So this, I view this as a type of rejection of something new within our psyche. And again, an extreme example of this would be something I've referenced before, where if somebody goes through um, a very horrible, horrible, traumatic experience in the moment, their, um, their conscious awareness can be projected outward where they're almost like having an out-of-body experience where they're not even present um, consciously for it. And then after it's over, they don't remember it. It's like a protective measure that, that the psyche can... can um, do can go to and so um, on a milder that's just an extreme example on a milder um, more common I feel like uh, uh, plane of existence it would mean to me just that our, our minds have a tendency to reject the new there's rejection at play and it's a part of um, I feel like a survival instinct right a function of our innate um, instincts that are that are all meant for our survival because we are drawn to what's familiar and that's been proven time and again um, in in uh, studies and in um, the uh, psychology circles of, of when you're talking about um, people's experiences so we're drawn to the familiar even if it's not the best thing for us because um, it's we know that it's like, well, if we're not going to die in this situation, then we feel like it's safe. And so I think that we just have this natural resistance to, to something new because it's risky. It's risky. And I think a lot of the, this happens like on the subconscious or even unconscious level. Um, and it's just a, a form of protection um, within our psyche, this rejection of, of newness, right? So we have to observe, we have to take our time and be patient enough to wait things through to be able to absorb and pull something in the new puzzle pieces, right? The new things we're learning to form a new paradigm, a, a, a new understanding about our reality. This, this is a, a long process that we have to go through. And so um, I just hope that gives you a lot to think about because in the end, the result is, is like she's gonna talk about here, the symbolism of the child. She says the union of, of the king and queen of the underworld produces a child. And the child is symbolic of this new, um, this newness within our psyche. It's like we're born again, um, a, a totally new set of eyes new perceptions, new paradigms about our reality, about the world that are going to better serve us because they're, they're more in line with the truth of the world, you know, and the fact that there is darkness in the world. And we're going to talk more about that. So now she's going to talk more about this child. She says the union of the king and the queen of the underworld produces a child. A child made in the underworld is a magic child who has all the potential associated with the underworld. And she talks about it uh, being like acute hearing and innate sensing. So this is closely aligned with our intuition, I feel like, you know. She says, um, <clears throat> during this time um, 
of the child, it's it's translated um, as far as meaning within our development of our psyche as that which shall become, the that which shall become stage. It is at this time that women on the journey have startling ideas. Some might call them grandiose, that are the result of having new and youthful eyes and expectations. So I view this as um, the stage when we're excited for something new, you know, but we're not really sure what. So it's kind of like this in-between stage, but we know that there's something to come, right? We're, we're pregnant with, with hope and with excitement for, um, for how our life is going to be different, right? Because we've left um, what we know isn't um, good for us, okay? So it says, the spirit baby sets sedentary women off climbing the Alps at age 45. <laughs> so she gives some examples of, um, you know, how we're motivated during this time. We may we may be willing to try things that we've never done before, um, things that that are um, giving ourselves um, new challenges, which is, is great, great for our mind, you know, in our body too. Um, so just new things. She says, to give birth is the psychic equivalent of becoming oneself. Oneself. So she has oneself, all one word, all one word and then oneself, one, right? meaning an undivided psyche. She specifies that. So we're talking about all the parts, right? And how they're not all cohesive. You know, like this one's falling asleep. <laughs> this one's trying to work with this one, but this one isn't catching on. Like, you know, throughout the whole book, we've talked about these different parts of the psyche represented by the characters and how, you know, one of them's off, you know, doing the wrong thing or, you know, <laughs> just... Um, so now she's talking about, again, the culmination, the, um, the maturity. So it's a maturation process of our psyche, everything, all parts coming together for, um, to bring us to this, this new point, <clears throat> an undivided psyche. Before this birth of new life in the underworld, a woman is likely to think all parts and personalities within her are rather like a hodgepodge of vagrants who wander in and out of her life. But in the underworld birth, a woman learns that anything that brushes by her is a part of her. Sometimes this differentiation of all the aspects of the psyche is hard to do, especially with the tendencies and urges we find repulsive. This reminds me of Skeleton Woman, right? That story. The challenge of loving unappealing aspects of ourselves is as much of an endeavor as any heroine has tried has ever tried so this is where you uh, we're talking about shadow work here okay you've heard of that term so then she goes into explaining um, that you know when <laughs> when we're talking about one person's psyche being divided into multiple parts and personalities and you know family members characters whatever it, it sort of sounds like people who have literally multiple personality disorder um, and so she's making the distinction here that we're not talking about psychopathy we're not talking about um, a psychotic disorder we're talking about a normal psyche and all the parts within one one psyche she says that um, the difference with somebody who's who's healthy that has no psychotic disorder says um, they hold all the inner selves in an orderly and rational manner which I thought is cool because I just did the post about ducks in a row <laughs> the other day um, so that's the difference right she says they are put to good use the person grows and thrives for the majority of women, mothering and raising the internal selves is a creative work, a way of knowledge, not a reason for becoming unnerved. So, she says, so the handless maiden is waiting to have a child, a new little wild self, right? So yes, until we get our footing, we are waiting. We're in a stage of waiting. The body in pregnancy does what it wants to do. The new life latches on, divides, swells. A woman at this stage of the psychic process may enter another entantiodromia, the psychic state in which all that was once held valuable is now not so valuable anymore. This was talked about before, if you remember. And further, may be replaced by new and extreme cravings for odd and unusual sights, experiences, and, and endeavors. So she's referencing, you know, pregnancy. Very similar. <clears throat> 
Um, so she's, she elaborates on the cravings, right? This is all about the transitional stage here. She says, and then there are the cravings. Oh la, a woman may crave to be near water or be belly down, her face in the earth, smelling that wild smell. She might have to drive into the wind. She may have to plant something, weed something, pull things out of the ground or put them into the ground. She may have to knead and bake wrapped in dough up to her elbows. She may have to trek into the hills leaping from rock to rock, trying out her voice against the mountain. She may need hours of starry nights where the stars are like face powder spilt on a black marble floor. She may feel she will die if she does not dance naked <laughs> in a thunderstorm. Sit in perfect silence. Return home ink stained, paint stained, tear stained, moon stained. A new self is on the way. So I just wanted to uh, give you a little little snippet there if you don't have the book of, of her writing style it's really beautiful the way she gives examples very poetic I feel she says our inner lives as we have known them are about to change while this does not mean we should throw away the decent and especially the supportive aspects of our lives and some kind of demented house cleaning <laughs> it does mean that in the descent the topside world and ideals pale and for a time we shall be restless and unsatisfied for the satisfaction, the fulfillment is in the process of being born in the inner reality. I love this. What it is we are hungering for can never be fulfilled by a mate, a job, money, a new this or that. So this is where you get that, that saying, happiness is within, right? What we hunger for is of the other world, the world that sustains our lives as women. And this child self we are awaiting is brought forth by just that means, by waiting. As time passes in our life and our work in the underworld, the child develops and will be born. Yeah. So um, she then goes into talking about the king's mother and the young queen, how they stay with each other. And it says the king's mother is guess who? Old Lake Sabe. She, she knows the ways of it all. Okay. Uh, so she who knows. So um, now we're going to get into talking about um, the process of understanding, right? So we've we've gotten enough puzzle pieces. We've connected enough dots to step away from uh, toxic situations in our life. Um, but we're in this stage of waiting, this in between, this transitional stage. And um, what's happening is we're... Um, the computer is computing up here and we're trying to get to the stage where we finally have a good understanding and a good grasp of things. So I really, really love this next section here. She says, <clears throat> once the child self is born, the old queen mother sends a message about the young queen's infant to the king. The messenger seems normal enough, but as he nears a stream of water, he becomes more and more sleepy, falls asleep, and the devil jumps out. This is a clue that tells us there will again be a challenge to the psyche during its next labor in the underworld. In the Greek mythos, in the underworld, there is a river called Leth or Lethe, L-E-T-H-E. And to drink of its waters causes one to forget all things said and done. Now, if you remember, the song uh, on the Frozen soundtrack, I think Frozen 2, about the river, it says um, it's full of memories. So the, the river in the Frozen movies is about holding memories, which is interesting because this is talking about, um, <coughs> I just read it. <laughs> um, yeah, to drink of its waters in Greek mythos, the river Lethe, to drink of its waters causes one to forget all things said and done. So you have memory and remembering and forgetting, right? And in the Frozen movies, Elsa goes to the, um, the river, symbolized by the glacier inside of a cave, right? Or maybe it was inside of a glacier itself. I'm not sure how they work. <laughs> um, but she's looking at the icy walls. She's facing the river and the, the frozen river in the movies. And she is remembering, right? But it's like an ancestral remembering. A connection with her ancestors here. So, yeah. I thought that was really cool. She says, psychologically, because remember in this story, 
the messengers fall asleep, okay? Psychologically, this means to fall asleep to one's actual life. I'm gonna pull you back to what we just talked about a little while earlier, the rejection of, of, of something new in our mind, right? I think it's an automatic process we don't even catch consciously. Uh, we, we sink um, our awareness automatically back to the familiar um, because it's um, our psyche considers the familiar safe if we haven't died you know that's that's the only <laughs> um, uh, requisite you know is is that well we didn't die even if it's not good for us even if it's not damaging so just remember that here Psychologically, this means to fall asleep to one's actual life. The runner who is supposed to connect and enable communication between these two main components of the new psyche cannot yet hold its own against the destructive slash seductive force in the, in the psyche. The communicating function of the psyche becomes sleepy, lies down, falls asleep, and forgets. Look how closely aligned and similar this description of this part of the psyche is to a narcissist. She says, the two main components of the new psyche cannot yet hold its own against the destructive and yet seductive force in the psyche. That's how a narcissist is. They wear a mask to seduce you. It doesn't have to be sexual. Um, it can just be a temptation of um, the intellect, a temptation of anything, anything to lure us uh, because they are predators, right? So, again, all of this can be applied internally and externally. <clears throat> There's predators here <laughs> and predators out here. So. so, guess who is always out and about? Why, the old tracker of maidens, the hungry devil. By the word devil in the story, we see how this story was overlaid by more recent religious material. In this story, the messenger, stream, and the sleep that causes forgetfulness reveal that the old religion is right underneath the storyline, just the next layer down. This is the archetypal pattern of descent since the beginning of time. And we too follow this timeless system. Likewise, we have a history of terrible chores behind us. We have seen death's steamy breath. We have braved the clutching forests, the marching trees, the roots that trip, the fog that blinds. So this is like our horrible experiences we've been through, right? We are psychic heroines with a valise full of metals. And who can blame us now? We want to rest. We deserve to rest for we have been through a lot. It's been a rough ride. And so we lie down next to a lovely stream. The sacred process is not forgotten. Just, just, well, we would like to take a break just for a while. You know, just going to close our eyes for a minute. And before we know it, the devil hops in on all four feet and changes the message meant to convey love and celebration into one meant to disgust. The devil represents the psychic aggravation that bedevils us as it sneers. Have you gone back to your old ways of innocence and naivety now that you are loved? Now that you gave birth, do you think it is all over, you foolish woman? Wow. Wow. Right? This is me saying wow. <laughs> and because we are near Leth or Lethe, the river, we snore on. This is the error all women make, not once, but many times. We forget to remember the devil. Wow. Yes, I wrote boom. <laughs> boom in the book here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I view this as, you've heard the term uh, rewiring your mind and how, <clears throat> how there can be, I'm so sorry, I'm still dealing with post-nasal drainage. It's hard to talk. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like what's familiar to us has created these deep ruts in our mind and to try and get thoughts, a thought stream to veer off of that rut because maybe it's destructive or bad for us or wrong or whatever, right? Like conditioning, um, as an example, if we try to get our, our mind to go in a new direction, it just 
tends to just, you know, go off for a minute and then it comes right back into that rut. Um, it's just a good visual, I feel like, to comprehend what this means and how hard it is um, um, to understand, to, to get your mind to go in a different direction. And, you know, I view this, as we're talking about this, as being a process of, of a maturing psyche. If you think of it like um, a toddler, you have to repeat yourself to a toddler over and over and over and over, right? So, because a toddler is just not going to retain um, things. So, view view the growth of your psyche in the same way. You know, I can't. I, I like to view it that way. It kind of helps me understand. So, when she says we forget to remember the devil, I want to bring uh, attention to a movie that that's really good. If you haven't seen it, called The Usual Suspects with Kevin Spacey. And um, there's a character in that movie. It has a quote. And um, the quote is, The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he did not exist. And when I read this, uh, this line here in the book, We Forget to Remember the Devil, I was immediately reminded of that quote. And, you know, I think that our world, our current society, supports this. And this is just a whole nother topic. <laughs> we could go way off and, and uh, talk a lot about this, right? But something for you to think about and explore on your own if you have interest. Um, like, for example, earlier she's talking about the different parts and pieces of the psyche and psychopathy. So I'm looking into that online and reading. And uh, I found, I think it was like helpline.com. They were talking about the seven um, signs or symptoms of psychopathy. And um, one of them is the inability to distinguish between right and wrong. And it caught my attention that they used the word inability. Because that's like saying a person who's choosing wrong is... They don't know any better. They, they're not able to choose what's right. So that would be an example of taking spirituality out of our reality, taking the devil and the influence of, of the devil out of our reality. It's like, well, they can't help it. They can't help that they're doing wrong. You see what I'm saying? Not that actually they are able to choose what's right. So just some things for you to think about. <laughs> I'm never trying to um, position myself as knowing it all. I don't. I'm just a seeker of truth um, and I'm trying to keep a growth mindset and I love to explore um, topics and learn and grow. So again, I just hope that you um, enjoy today's presentation. I'm going to pause here. This section, this uh, fifth stage is very long, so um, it'll, we'll have to go through a couple of different two or three videos to cover it just to make sure we have time to cover everything. So thank you again for coming along today. Um, and I hope you have a beautiful day and I will see you again very soon.